family. A very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us today from your homes. I'd love to wish you all a very happy Good Friday. You know, some people wonder why do we call this day Good Friday when we remember what happened to Jesus close to 2,000 years ago. And if you think about it, Scripture tells us how Jesus is betrayed by someone so close to him, how he's abandoned by his disciples who promised to never leave him. He's then falsely accused and abused by the religious leaders. He's then executed in one of the cruelest uh, ways imaginable, crucifixion. And then ultimately he has to carry and bear the weight of God's full wrath upon himself. When you think about that, you might wonder, is it okay to call this day Good Friday? Well, those things did happen. But scripture tells us that so much more happened as well. Such as when Jesus died on the cross, God's grace is then freely given to all men and women. How as God's wrath has been poured out on Jesus, so comes God's mercy, forgiving all sins. When Jesus cries out on the cross, it is finished. That the very curtain that separated man from God for so, so long was torn by God. That we could now approach him as father with a boldness and a confidence and be with him forever. Jesus knew what this day would hold. And he knowing it all, he chose to go ahead with the plan. He offers himself as a sacrifice. He chooses to pay our price. He chooses to be our savior and to rescue us. When we know that, that is then why we sing. That is then why we rejoice. That's why we are grateful and celebrate. That is why we will call this day Good Friday. And so wherever you might be and whoever you are with, my prayer for us today is that we would ask God for a greater revelation of who he is and what he's done for us. Our prayer is that we would know more about who Jesus is. We'd know what he's done and what he's accomplished for you and for me and for all people. And I believe that when we have this revelation of who Christ is, of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that our response will be one of worship, of adoration, of gratitude, as we thank our God for being our Savior and saving us. And so we're going to do that this morning. And I want to encourage you this morning that we're not going to sing to a Jesus who is dying on the cross. We're not singing to a Jesus who is broken or beaten. We're singing to Jesus who is alive. Jesus who is the King of Kings, who's given the name above every name. Jesus who is our Savior. Jesus who is our Lord. We get to sing to Him. And so let's do that today. Let's worship our God, our King, our Savior. So I'm going to pray for us, um, and then we'll get into a time of singing, and then Marcus will give us a word of encouragement. So let us pray. Father, I thank you that you are our Savior. I thank you, Lord, for the price that you paid. Jesus, I thank you that you gave up yourself as a sacrifice for us to be our Lord, to be our Savior. And Lord, my prayer for us today is that we would have a revelation of who you are, Lord, and what you have done. And I pray, Lord, that as we understand more of who you are and what you've done, that we would draw nearer to you with the boldness and confidence, Father, that you call us towards you too. And so, Lord, awaken our hearts today. Awaken our understanding. May we know you more. And may we worship you and adore you, for you are worthy of it all. We ask us all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Kindness as the flood When the prince 
and laugh our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he will never be forgotten throughout his So what I'm going to do now as we talk about the Easter weekend is to chat to the children first. I know most of the times what you look forward to is Easter eggs. Yay! Easter egg hunt, chocolate, bunnies, all sorts of things like that. But what I'm going to do, and I just want to encourage the children to come closer, is I'm going to talk to you about the first Easter, where all of this came from. Now, Easter has two parts to it. And we're going to do the first part now, and then the second part we're going to do on Sunday. So the first part took place on Friday. So I want to know from you, what is the biggest thing you could do to help somebody? You could do their chores for them. Uh, maybe you could... Give gifts. You could give them gifts. You could help your mom do something. You could... Put water out for the dogs or give them food. There's so many things we could do to help each other. And we're going to learn about how God helped us. That's important to remember. Then the other thing is, I want to know, if you do something that's bad, like you tell a lie or you pinch your sister 
or you ugly to your mom and dad, do you get disciplined? Does yes. your mom discipline you or dad discipline you? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, what happens if you do things that are wrong and somebody else gets disciplined? That sounds weird, isn't it? But that's exactly what Jesus did. We did the wrong thing and Jesus paid the price. But how about this? Jesus did nothing that was wrong. The Bible says he did nothing that was wrong or sinful or evil, but yet he was punished for our sin. Isn't that awesome? So what happened on this Friday, after Jesus had had uh, the Last Supper with his disciples, <clears throat> they came and arrested him, and then they took him, and they started to question him, they started to say things to him, they were ugly to him, they spat, they hurt him, they whipped him, his black back was bleeding, and they were saying, who do you think you are? You call yourself the king of the Jews? And they hurt him. <clears throat> and eventually, <coughs> excuse me, they took him to the Roman authorities, and the Roman authorities said, well, what do you want to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Do you know what crucify means? It's no. quite a big word, but you know, this is what it means, is they put you on a wooden cross and they hammer nails in your hands and your feet and that's where you die. And you know what God's plan was? Is through Jesus dying on the cross and through his blood when he was whipped that we would be forgiven our sin. And while he was there, right there on the cross, guess what happened? God put all of the sin on Jesus so that we would be free. And so Jesus died on the cross so that we would be free of our sin. Isn't that awesome? Yes. And then they took him off the cross when he was dead and they put him in the tomb. And there he stayed until, I'll tell you the rest on Sunday, okay? No. Yes, on Sunday, the rest of the story. So what is Easter all about? Of course, for every single Christian on the planet, we live with reality of Easter every single day. From the first Easter until now, uh, we celebrate the forgiveness of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. All of these are important for our salvation and for our daily living. Not only for when we are eventually with God in heaven, but right here on this earth. We need the reality of what took place on Friday to make it day to day. We need the reality of what took place at that first Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We need it to live today. But for the sake of those who are perhaps dialing in, and perhaps that's you, I want to explain it because it is important to understand what took place on Friday. What was Easter all about just generally? So 2,000 years ago, Jesus um, is eventually betrayed and he's taken by the temple gods to stand before the Sanhedrin, the religious community of the day and the religious leaders of the day uh, accuse him of so many things. He has angered them no end and challenged their very frail, uh, very hypocritical religious system. In other words, religion's going to get us nowhere. And Christ comes in like a breath of fresh air and sets people free all over the place. But eventually this gets to them and they want him dealt with. They take him to the Roman authorities and they demand that he is crucified. And so we have the reality of Easter unfolding. And so what happened on Friday is all about pain. It's all about suffering. It's all about separation from God. But not ours. It's Jesus. Jesus suffers what we should have suffered. We should have suffered pain. We should have been separated from God because of our sin. You see, many of us think that, you know, well, Christianity is for bad people, you know, for ex-drug addicts or criminals and so on. No, the Bible is clear. Every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone, everyone. It doesn't matter how good you are, what kind of disposition you have, or how much humanitarian aid you've given, or whatever. The issue is we all need saving. We all need to pay for the sin that every one of us commits on a daily basis. And so Christ 
kind of stepped in and interceded on our behalf and said, I'll pay for the sin of mankind. Isn't that awesome? Uh, this wasn't some program that heaven trotted out. It, it was a, a desire of God from the beginning of the world to send his son to the cross to die in our place so that we might be free, we might be forgiven. He was motivated by love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus hung on the cross because of love. He endured the pain because of love. He could see beyond that moment into the future and he could see throngs of people becoming the family of God. And so that for you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, listen carefully because I'm going to I'm going to go through some very pertinent, some very startling scripture um, on the suffering of Christ. And, and what he suffered is what we should have suffered. It was unfair that he suffered that way, but he chose to do that so that we could be set free. So listen as I go through these scriptures so that you can identify with this. And for the first time, bow your head and pray and ask Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior. Or for us who are already Christ followers, we can thank Him even more. It, it can propel our faith even um, more forward. It can motivate us even more to love Him and appreciate what He's done for us. When we understand what He did on Friday and the anguish that He went through, I tell you, it, it, it makes us eternally thankful. It causes us to be a people of hope. We need hope. And this is a message of hope. Even though Friday is about, about pain and suffering and death, it's a message of hope because we are set free through what Christ suffered. So I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 53. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. In other words, by world standards, by the standards of media or the standards of the entertainment industry. He wasn't some superhero in a cape. That's how we see a savior. Somebody come to set us free. No, there was nothing in his natural appearance that drew us to him. What he came to do had nothing to do with his personality or his charisma. It had everything to do with his heart of obedience and submitting himself to the will of God. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. Grief. He turned our back. We turned our backs on him, and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own ways, yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. That's important to notice. All of us, and that, when the Bible says all, that means every single one of us. Every one of us have gone astray. But God lays on him the sin of us all. Because we've gone astray, we should have that punishment. He should lay uh, that suffering, that judgment on us, but he doesn't. He gives it to Christ. That's what it means to, be sub uh, to, to do a substitutionary work. He takes the blow for what should have happened to us. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had deceived no one. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. Like I said, it was always God's plan. You see it right through the scriptures. There's always this kind of looking forward in the Old Testament to that moment when God crushed Christ, when he put on him the sin of this world, when he judged him guilty in our place. Always God's plan to do this. 
Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and he and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels and sinners. Um, that word is very important. He, he interceded. He, he stood in the gap. So here we are. We've gone astray. We have rebelled. We have sinned. And we deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's punishment. We deserve to die for our sins. But intercession is he stands in the gap and he takes the blow for us. He, he submits himself to the pain and the judgment so that we can be free. That's the role of an intercessor. So let's look at some of these, these words and phrases because they help us understand what Christ went through that I don't have to go through. You don't have to go through. And like I said, if this is you for the first time you're in the gospel, this is what it's about. So the scriptures there in Isaiah 53 say he was despised. He was despised. It was not like they'd welcome Jesus as a hero. He was despised. Um, the very good he was trying to do, um, the religious order of the day despised him. The Romans despised him, laughed at him. Um, many people were influenced by this and despised him. And at that last moment during the crucifixion on Friday, the one thing that you could say about all those who handled him, they despised him. They rejected him. He was a man of sorrows. When you saw him, you realized that it wasn't just this pain of the whipping and the crown of thorns and being struck and being hit with sticks. It really was within a grief that we just do not understand. He was punished by God, stricken and afflicted by him, pierced. A sword was thrust into his side. He was crushed, crushed on the outside, crushed within through the weight of sin, beaten. The Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Imagine the sins of all of mankind, past, present and future. That gets laid on the Lord. He submits himself to the will of God and that's what crushes him. It's in that moment that he says, it is done. In other words, the full weight of mankind's sin is on me and it's done. I've borne their sins and he's punished and he dies that way. Oppressed, treated harshly. The religious order of the day treated him badly. The Roman soldiers treated him badly. At the foot of the cross, they're busy playing dice so that they can see who gets his garment. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. In the Old Testament, the, lamb, the blood of lambs and bulls and goats atoned for our sin. It was through that blood that we were set free. Right in the Garden of Eden, an animal is killed to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. And so our nakedness needs to be covered and blood needs to be shed for this. And so he became the Lamb of God. One day Jesus will come back, come back as the roaring lion of Judah. Come back triumphant. But... This, the first coming of Christ, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He gave himself up as that sacrificial lamb and paid for our sin in full. His blood is on the altar in heaven. God is happy. So through Christ we have forgiveness. No more. Once and for all it was done, no more does he have to die. No more do we have to die. Unjustly condemned. No one cared. His life was cut short in midstream. They say 33, 34 years old is when Christ died. He was cut short. But you see, the whole object wasn't to come here for his own will, his own purpose. It was so that he could come and fulfill the will of God. The night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. The disciples fall asleep. And there's that moment when it says his tears are like drops of blood. That's the anguish that was in his heart. He was fighting the battle of the cross in prayer before. And he says, Lord, if this cup could pass from me. In other words, if I don't have to do this, I, I wouldn't choose to actually do this. I'd, it would be good for it to pass. He knew it was coming. 
then there's this great moment. Not my will, but your will be done. It's not about me and my comfort. It's there's a, there's a job to do. Humanity needs to be saved and Christ submits himself to the will of God. That is going to be our entire lives is learning how to submit to the will of God. He will bear their sins. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Anguish. He exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels and sinners. See, this is what took place on Friday. Friday was an incredible work of love by Christ. It cost him his life. He suffered pain and he suffered separation from God. He suffered like no man has suffered before. The very word excruciating when it comes to describing pain is a word that is derived from the cross. Excruciating is from the cross. This is the kind of pain. There is no greater pain that a person could suffer. And so we're very thankful to the Lord. And we need to understand that all of that he went through so that we could be free. I want to encourage you. If you are listening or watching um, this video broadcast and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is good news for you. Today, that can change. Today, your life can start afresh anew. You can start with the freedom that is yours and with the forgiveness that is yours. You see, Christ has set all of mankind free. In a manner of speaking, all of us have been set free. But it's now up to us to appropriate it to make it mine. It's up to you to pray and say, Lord, I accept you into my life as Lord and Savior. Forgive me of doing it my way. I, I want to do it your way. I want to become a child of God. And of course, immediately that takes place. And of course, for those who perhaps wandered away, this is a great moment to reset, to say, let me just do this God's way. Let me live in the reality of this freedom and this forgiveness. Uh, and, and let me in, an, in a fresh way, commit myself to Jesus. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If this is what you would like to do, the words will come up on the screen. Pray this prayer and ask Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior. So I'll lead you. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Please forgive me my sins through the blood of Jesus. Thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross in my place. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. From this moment on, I'm a child of God. I'm born again. Thank you for this free gift to salvation. Just carry on praying. I'd like to pray over you. Lord, I thank you for those who've prayed this prayer. All across the world today, I know many have done this, and especially for those who are listening to this broadcast. I just pray for them that you would help them grow in their faith. You would help them understand the importance of prayer, the importance of reading your word, the importance of breaking bread, the importance, Lord, of connecting in. Um, uh, we know we're a bit limited now because of the lockdown, but we can still connect through social media and that. And I pray that that would take place, Lord. And so I commit those who pray this prayer to you, thanking you that you're going to guide and lead them into this amazing future that you have for them. So what do you do now? Please speak to those that perhaps invited you to listen to this broadcast, friends that you know, Christ followers. Also, please get hold of us. The details, uh, our contact details will come up at the bottom of the screen. You know, either email us or phone us. We want to follow up on this visit. We want to put some good literature in your hand, which explains what has taken place, shows you the scriptures, helps you kind of grow in your, in your faith. Um, so get hold of us and for any other reason if you want prayer for healing if you want to just chat to us you want a bit of counsel for some issues we are there for you we want to help you uh, so take advantage of those numbers at the bottom of the screen awesome so what we're going to do now is as a church we're going to break bread um, I'd encourage you now to push pause and go and get some juice and go and get some bread and then Adele and I are going to do this with you So we're going to begin breaking bread by reading a scripture from Luke chapter 22 verses 19 to 20. Thank you Adele. And he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so, to recap, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have this new agreement with God that we forgive it. And that's why central to every child of God's faith is that we break bread regularly. We don't wait for church meetings only. We break bread as home groups, we break bread as couples, we break bread as individuals, as families. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. And the key in that passage of scripture is we do this in remembrance of him. So we as families and individuals now as we break bread, we're going to take the bread and we're going to take the juice and we're going to remember Jesus. So as we break, as we break the bread, we remember that his body was broken for us. He suffered for us and through suffering, he paid the price. Uh, God judged him on our behalf and we are free. So I want to encourage you to take bread now and let's eat together. Thank you, Lord, for your body broken mm -hmm. for us so that we don't have to suffer. We don't have to go through the anguish and the pain. And we eat with thankful hearts. Thank you, Lord. And then we drink. And this juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ. So every time we eat and we drink, we remember Jesus and we say, thank you, Lord. So we drink together. Oh 
righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus now by this I sacrifice on your cross your life laid down for us your life in exchange for ours it's an incredible truth and an incredible glory and an incredible love thank you Jesus Father we thank you for the free, free gift of salvation through Jesus Jesus, thank you that it was love that drove you to the cross. Thank you that it was love that enabled you to bear what you bore on the cross. And so, with thankful hearts, we remember and we say thank you for our forgiveness and our freedom. Pray your blessing over every single one of us here, Lord. Uh, pray that uh, the reality of our salvation would continually encourage us forward, Lord. It would encourage us to work at our salvation. It would encourage us to live in a place of celebrating forgiveness and freedom. Uh, that, Lord, it wouldn't be de- our faith wouldn't be dependent on meetings, but on a personal relationship with you uh, that we can share with each other as well. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your day today.